May 23, the ark brought to the temple. Solomon then summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral families of the Israelites. They were to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant to the temple from its location in the city of David, also known as Zion. So all the men of Israel assembled before King Solomon at the annual festival of shelters, which is held in early autumn in the month of Ithanum. When all the elders of Israel arrived, the priests picked up the ark. The priests and Levites brought up the ark of the Lord along with the special tent and all the sacred items that had been in it. There, before the ark, King Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed so many sheep, goats, and cattle that no one could keep count. Then the priests carried the ark of the Lord's covenant into the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and placed it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the ark, forming a canopy over the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the temple's main room, the holy place, but not from the outside. They are still there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Mount Sinai, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they left the land of Egypt. When the priests came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. From Second Chronicles So Solomon finished all his work on the temple of the Lord. Then he brought all the gifts his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the various articles, and he stored them in the treasuries of the temple of God. The ark brought to the temple. Solomon then summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of tribes, the leaders of the ancestral families of Israel. They were to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to the temple from its location in the city of David, also known as Zion. So all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the annual festival of shelters, which is held in early autumn. When all the elders of Israel arrived, the Levites picked up the Ark. The priests and Levites brought up the ark along with the special tent and all the sacred items that had been in it. There, before the ark, King Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed so many sheep, goats, and cattle that no one could keep count. Then the priests carried the ark of the Lord's covenant into the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and placed it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the ark, forming a canopy over the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the temple's main room, the holy place, but not from the outside. They are still there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Mount Sinai, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they left Egypt. Then the priests left the holy place. All the priests who were present had purified themselves, whether or not they were on duty that day. And the Levites, who were musicians, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and all their sons and brothers, were dressed in fine linen robes and stood at the east side of the altar, playing cymbals, lyres, and harps. They were joined by 120 priests who were playing trumpets. The trumpeters and singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. At that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. From 1 Kings, Solomon blesses the people. Then Solomon prayed, O Lord, you have said that you would live in a thick cloud of darkness. Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a place where you can live forever. Then the king turned around to the entire community of Israel standing before him and gave this blessing. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept the promise he made to my father David. For he told my father, from the day I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as the place where a temple should be built to honor my name. But I have chosen David to be king over my people Israel. Then Solomon said, 
My father David wanted to build this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, You wanted to build the temple to honor my name. Your intention is good, but you are not the one to do it. One of your own sons will build the temple to honor me. And now the Lord has fulfilled the promise he made, for I have become king in my father's place, and I now sit on the throne of Israel just as the Lord promised. I have built this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, and I have prepared a place there for the ark, which contains the covenant that the Lord made with our ancestors when he brought them out of Egypt. From Second Chronicles Then Solomon prayed, O Lord, you have said that you would live in a thick cloud of darkness. Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a place where you can live forever. Then the king turned around to the entire community of Israel standing before him and gave this blessing. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept the promise he made to my father David. For he told my father, from the day I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as the place where a temple should be built to honor my name. Nor have I chosen a king to lead my people Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem as the place for my name to be honored, and I have chosen David to be king over my people Israel. Then Solomon said, My father David wanted to build this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, You wanted to build the temple to honor my name. Your intention is good, but you are not the one to do it. One of your own sons will build the temple to honor me. And now the Lord has fulfilled the promise he made, for I have become king in my father's place, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. I have built this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark, which contains the covenant that the Lord made with the people of Israel. From First Kings, Solomon's Prayer of Dedication Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community of Israel. He lifted his hands toward heaven, and he prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven above or on the earth below. You keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. You made that promise with your own mouth, and with your own hands you have fulfilled it today. And now, O Lord God of Israel, carry out the additional promise you made to your servant David, my father. For you said to him, If your descendants guard their behavior and faithfully follow me as you have done, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel." Now, O God of Israel, fulfill this promise to your servant David, my father. But will God really live on earth? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you today. May you watch over this temple night and day, this place where you have said my name will be there. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from me and your people Israel when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live, and when you hear forgive. If someone wrongs another person and is required to take an oath of innocence in front of your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and judge between your servants, the accuser and the accused. Punish the guilty as they deserve. Acquit the innocent because of their innocence. If your people Israel are defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you, and if they turn to you and acknowledge your name and pray to you here in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and return them to this land you gave their ancestors. If the skies are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and if they pray toward this temple and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins because you have punished them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them to follow the right path and send rain on your land that you have given to your people as their special possession. 
If there is a famine in the land, or a plague, or crop disease, or a tax of locusts or caterpillars, or if your people's enemies are in the land besieging their towns, whatever disaster or disease there is, and if your people Israel pray about their troubles, raising their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and forgive. Give your people what their actions deserve, for you alone know each human heart. Then they will fear you as long as they live in the land you gave to our ancestors. In the future, foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel will hear of you. They will come from distant lands because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your powerful arm. And when they pray toward this temple, Then hear from heaven where you live, and grant what they ask of you. In this way, all the people of the earth will come to know and fear you, just as your own people Israel do. They too will know that this temple I have built honors your name. If your people go out where you send them to fight their enemies, and if they pray to the Lord by turning toward this city you have chosen, and toward this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers from heaven and uphold their cause. If they sin against you, and who has never sinned, you might become angry with them and let their enemies conquer them and take them captive to their land far away or near. But in that land of exile, they might turn to you in repentance and pray. We have sinned, done evil, and acted wickedly. If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of their enemies and pray toward the land you gave to their ancestors, toward this city you have chosen, and toward this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers and their petition from heaven where you live and uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all All the offenses they have committed against you, make their captors merciful to them, for they are your people, your special possession, whom you brought out of the iron-smelting furnace of Egypt. May your eyes be open to my requests and to the requests of your people Israel. May you hear and answer them whenever they cry out to you. For when you brought our ancestors out of Egypt, O sovereign Lord, you told your servant Moses that you had set Israel apart from all the nations of the earth to be your own special possession. From Second Chronicles Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community of Israel, and he lifted his hands in prayer. Now Solomon had made a bronze platform seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet high, and had placed it at the center of the temple's outer courtyard. He stood on the platform, and then he knelt in front of the entire community of Israel and lifted his hands toward heaven. He prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven and earth. You keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. You made that promise with your own mouth, and with your own hands you have fulfilled it today. And now, O Lord, God of Israel, carry out the additional promise you made to your servant David, my father. For you said to him, If your descendants guard their behavior and faithfully follow my law as you have done, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Now, O Lord, God of Israel, fulfill this promise to your servant David. But will God really live on earth among people? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you. May you watch over this temple day and night, this place where you have said you would put your name. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from me and your people Israel when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live, and when you hear, forgive. If someone wrongs another person and is required to take an oath of innocence in front of your altar at this temple, then hear from heaven and judge between your servants, the accuser, and the accused. Pay back the guilty as they deserve. Acquit the innocent because of their innocence. 
if your people Israel are defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you, and if they turn back and acknowledge your name and pray to you here in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and return them to this land you gave to them and to their ancestors. If the skies are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and if they pray toward this temple and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins because you have punished them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them to follow the right path and send rain on your land that you have given to your people as their special possession. If there is a famine in the land, or a plague, or crop disease, or attacks of locusts, or caterpillars, or if your people's enemies are in the land besieging their towns, whatever disaster or disease there is, and if your people Israel pray about their troubles or sorrow, raising their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live, and forgive. Give your people what their actions deserve, for you alone know each human heart. Then they will fear you and walk in your ways as long as they live in the land you gave to our ancestors. In the future, foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel will hear of you. They will come from distant lands when they hear of your great name and your strong hand and your powerful arm. And when they pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and grant what they ask of you. In this way, all the people of the earth will come to know and fear you, just as your own people Israel do. They too will know that this temple I have built honors your name. If your people go out where you send them to fight their enemies, and if they pray to you by turning toward this city you have chosen and toward this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers from heaven and uphold their cause. If they sin against you, and who has never sinned, You might become angry with them and let their enemies conquer them and take them captive to a foreign land far away or near. But in that land of exile, they might turn to you in repentance and pray, We have sinned, done evil, and acted wickedly. If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of their captivity and pray toward the land you gave to their ancestors, toward this city you have chosen, and toward this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers and their petitions from heaven where you live and uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. O my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to all the prayers made to you in this place. And now arise, O Lord God, and enter your resting place, along with the ark, the symbol of your power. May your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your loyal servants rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject the king you have anointed. Remember your unfailing love for your servant David. May 24, the Dedication of the Temple When Solomon finished making these prayers and petitions to the Lord, he stood up in front of the altar of the Lord where he had been kneeling with his hands raised toward heaven. He stood and in a loud voice blessed the entire congregation of Israel. Praise the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the wonderful promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us or abandon us. May he give us the desire to do his will in everything and to obey all the commands, decrees, and regulations that he gave our ancestors. And may these words that I have prayed in the presence of the Lord be before him constantly, day and night, so that the Lord our God may give justice to me and to his people Israel according to each day's needs. Then people all over the earth will know that the Lord alone is God and there is no other. And may you be completely faithful to the Lord our God. May you always obey his decrees and commands just as you are doing today. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices to the Lord. Solomon offered to the Lord a peace offering of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the temple of the Lord. 
That same day, the king consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of peace offerings there, because the bronze altar in the Lord's presence was too small to hold all the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings. Then Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters in the presence of the Lord our God. A large congregation had gathered from as far away as Labo Hamath in the north and the brook of Egypt in the south. The celebration went on for fourteen days in all, seven days for the dedication of the altar and seven days for the festival of shelters. After the festival was over, Solomon sent the people home. They blessed the king and went to their homes joyful and glad because the Lord had been good to his servant David and to his people Israel. From Second Chronicles When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices to the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their assigned positions, and so did the Levites, who were singing, His faithful love endures forever. They accompanied the singing with music from the instruments King David had made for praising the Lord. Across from the Levites, the priests blew the trumpets while all Israel stood. Solomon then consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings there, because the bronze altar he had built could not hold all the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrificial fat. For the next seven days, Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters. A large congregation had gathered from as far away as Lebo Hamath in the north and the brook of Egypt in the south. On the eighth day, they had a closing ceremony, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival of shelters for seven days. Then, at the end of the celebration, Solomon sent the people home. They were all joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and to his people Israel. From 1 Kings, the Lord's response to Solomon. So Solomon finished building the temple of the Lord, as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, as he had done before at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your petition. I have set this temple apart to be holy, this place you have built where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. As for you, if you will follow me with integrity and godliness as David your father did, obeying all my commands, decrees, and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty over Israel forever. For I made this promise to your father David, one of your descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the commands and decrees I have given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot Israel from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honor my name. I will make Israel an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled and will shake their heads in amazement. They will ask, why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? And the answer will be, because his people abandoned the Lord their God, who brought their ancestors out of Egypt, and they worshipped other gods instead and bowed down to them. That is why the Lord has brought all these disasters on them. From Second Chronicles So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord, as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or command grasshoppers to devour your crops, or send plagues among you. 
Then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. As for you, if you faithfully follow me as David your father did, obeying all my commands, decrees, and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty. For I made this covenant with your father David when I said, One of your descendants will always rule over Israel. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the decrees and commands I have given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot the people from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honor my name. I will make it an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled. They will ask, Why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? And the answer will be, Because his people abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt, and they worshipped other gods instead, and bowed down to them. That is why he has brought all these disasters on them. From First Kings Solomon's Agreement with Hiram. It took Solomon twenty years to build the Lord's temple and his own royal palace. At the end of that time, he gave twenty towns in the land of Galilee to King Hiram of Tyre. Hiram had previously provided all the cedar and cypress timber and gold that Solomon had requested. But when Hiram came from Tyre to see the towns Solomon had given him, he was not at all pleased with them. What kind of towns are these, my brother? he asked. So Hiram called that area Kabul, which means worthless, as it is still known today. Nevertheless, Hiram paid Solomon 9,000 pounds of gold. May 25, Solomon's Many Achievements It took Solomon 20 years to build the Lord's temple in his own royal palace. At the end of that time, Solomon turned his attention to rebuilding the towns that King Hiram had given him, and he settled Israelites in them. Solomon also fought against the town of Hamath Zobah and conquered it. He rebuilt Tadmor in the wilderness and built towns in the region of Hamath as supply centers. He fortified the towns of Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon, rebuilding their walls and installing barred gates. He also rebuilt Baalath and other supply centers and constructed towns where his chariots and horses could be stationed. He built everything he desired in Jerusalem and Lebanon and throughout his entire realm. There were still some people living in the land who were not Israelites, including the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These were descendants of the nations whom the people of Israel had not destroyed. So Solomon conscripted them for his labor force, and they serve in the labor force to this day. But Solomon did not conscript any of the Israelites for his labor force. Instead, he assigned them to serve as fighting men officers in his army, commanders of his chariots, and charioteers. King Solomon appointed 250 of them to supervise the people. Solomon moved his wife, Pharaoh's daughter, from the city of David to the new palace he had built for her. He said, My wife must not live in King David's palace, for the ark of the Lord has been there, and it is holy ground. Then Solomon presented burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar he had built for him in front of the entry room of the temple. He offered the sacrifices for the Sabbaths, the new moon festivals, and the three annual festivals, the Passover celebration, the festival of harvest, and the festival of shelters, as Moses had commanded. In assigning the priests to their duties, Solomon followed the regulations of his father David, He also assigned the Levites to lead the people in praise and to assist the priests in their daily duties. And he assigned the gatekeepers to their gates by their divisions, following the commands of David, the man of God. Solomon did not deviate in any way from David's commands concerning the priests and Levites and the treasuries. So Solomon made sure that all the work related to building the temple of the Lord was carried out, from the day its foundation was laid to the day of its completion. Later, Solomon went to Ezion-Geber and Elith, ports along the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom, 
Hiram sent him ships commanded by his own officers and manned by experienced crews of sailors. These ships sailed to Ophir with Solomon's men and brought back to Solomon almost 17 tons of gold. This is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, the royal palace, the supporting terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and the cities of Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer, killing the Canaanite population and burning it down. He gave the city to his daughter as a wedding gift when she married Solomon. So Solomon rebuilt the city of Gezer. He also built up the towns of Lower Beth Horon. Baalith, and Tamar in the wilderness within his land. He built towns as supply centers and constructed towns where his chariots and horses could be stationed. He built everything he desired in Jerusalem and Lebanon and throughout his entire realm. There were still some people living in the land who were not Israelites, including Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These were descendants of the nations whom the people of Israel had not completely destroyed. So Solomon conscripted them for his labor force, and they serve in the labor force to this day. But Solomon did not conscript any of the Israelites for forced labor. Instead, he assigned them to serve as fighting men, government officials, officers and captains in his army, commanders of his chariots and charioteers. Solomon appointed 550 of them to supervise the people working on his various projects. Solomon moved his wife, Pharaoh's daughter, from the city of David to the new palace he had built for her. Then he constructed the supporting terraces. Three times each year, Solomon presented burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar he had built for the Lord. He also burned incense to the Lord, and so he finished the work of building the temple. King Solomon also built a fleet of ships at Ezion Geber, a port near Elith, in the land of Edom along the shore of the Red Sea. Hiram sent experienced crews of sailors to sail the ships with Solomon's men. They sailed to Ophir and brought back to Solomon some 16 tons of gold. The Queen of Sheba's Visit When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, which brought honor to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She arrived in Jerusalem with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, large quantities of gold, and precious jewels. When she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. Solomon had answers for all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba realized how very wise Solomon was, and when she saw the palace he had built, she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables, the organization of his officials, and their splendid clothing, the cupbearers, and the burnt offerings Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. She exclaimed to the king, Everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of it. Your wisdom and prosperity are far beyond what I was told. How happy your people must be. What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day listening to your wisdom. Praise the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king so you can rule with justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices, and precious jewels. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In addition, Hiram's ships brought gold from Ophir, and they also brought rich cargoes of red sandalwood and precious jewels. The king used the sandalwood to make railings for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and to construct lyres and harps for the musicians. Never before or since has there been such a supply of sandalwood. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba whatever she asked for, besides all the customary gifts he had so generously given. Then she and all her attendants returned to their own land. From Second Chronicles When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. She arrived with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, large quantities of gold, and precious jewels. When she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. 
Solomon had answers for all her questions. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba realized how wise Solomon was, and when she saw the palace he had built, she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables, the organization of his officials and their splendid clothing, the cupbearers and their robes, and the burnt offerings Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. She exclaimed to the king, Everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of your great wisdom. It is far beyond what I was told. How happy your people must be. What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day listening to your wisdom. Praise the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne as king to rule for him. Because God loves Israel and desires this kingdom to last forever, he has made you king over them so you can rule with justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices, and precious jewels. Never before had there been spices as fine as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In addition, the crews of Hiram and Solomon brought gold from Ophir, and they also brought red sandalwood and precious jewels. The king used the sandalwood to make steps for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and to construct lyres and harps for the musicians. Never before had such beautiful things been seen in Judah. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba whatever she asked for, gifts of greater value than the gifts she had given him. Then she and all her attendants returned to their own land. From First Kings Solomon's Wealth and Splendor Each year Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. This did not include the additional revenue he received from merchants and traders, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than 15 pounds. He also made 300 smaller shields of hammered gold, each weighing nearly 4 pounds. The king placed these shields in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a huge throne, decorated with ivory and overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps and a rounded back. There were armrests on both sides of the seat, and the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. There were also twelve other lions, one standing on each end of the six steps. No other throne in all the world could be compared with it. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold, as were all the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. They were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships that sailed with Hiram's fleet. Once every three years, the ships returned loaded with gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. People from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year, everyone who visited brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone, and valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Cilicia. The king's traders acquired them from Cilicia at the standard price. At that time, chariots from Egypt could be purchased for 600 pieces of silver and horses for 150 pieces of silver. They were then exported to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. From Second Chronicles each year, Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. This did not include the additional revenue he received from merchants and traders. All the kings of Arabia and the governors of the provinces also brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than 15 pounds. He also made 300 smaller shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than 7.5 pounds. The king placed these shields in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. 
Then the king made a huge throne, decorated with ivory and overlaid with pure gold. The throne had six steps with a footstool of gold. There were armrests on both sides of the seat, and the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. There were also twelve other lions, one standing on each end of the six steps. No other throne in all the world could be compared with it. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold, as were all the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. They were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships manned by the sailors sent by Hiram. Once every three years, the ships returned loaded with gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. Kings from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year, everyone who visited brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his horses and chariots, and he had 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River in the north to the land of the Philistines and the border of Egypt in the south. The king made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone, and valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and many other countries. Summary of Solomon's Reign Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone, and valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Cilicia. The king's traders acquired them from Cilicia at the standard price. At that time, chariots from Egypt could be purchased for 600 pieces of silver and horses for 150 pieces of silver. They were then exported to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. May 26. Solomon's Officials and Governors King Solomon now ruled over all Israel, and these were his high officials. Azariah, son of Zadok, was the priest. Elohoref and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, were court secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was the royal historian. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was commander of the army. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, was in charge of the district governors. Zabud, son of Nathan, a priest, was a trusted advisor to the king. Ahishar was manager of the palace property. Adoniram, son of Abda, was in charge of the labor force. Solomon also had twelve district governors who were over all Israel. They were responsible for providing food for the king's household. Each of them arranged provisions for one month of the year. These are the names of the twelve governors. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, Ben-Decker in Mekes, Shealbam, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan, Ben-Hezid in Araboth, including Soko and all the land of Hefer, Ben-Abinadab in all of Naphoth Dor. He was married to Tephath, one of Solomon's daughters. Be'ena, son of Ahilud in Teanach and Megiddo, all of Bethshan near Zarephthan, below Jezreel, and all the territory from Bethshan to Abel Mahilo and over to Jachmium. Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead, including the towns of Jair, named for Jair of the tribe of Manasseh, in Gilead, and in the Argob region of Bashan, including sixty large fortified towns with bronze bars on their gates. Ahinadab, son of Ido in Maenaim, Ahimez in Naphtali, he was married to Basmuth, another of Solomon's daughters. Be'ena, son of Hushai, in Asher, and in Eloth. Jehoshaphat, son of Perua, in Issachar. Shimei, son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri, in the land of Gilead, including the territories of King Sihon of the Amorites and King Og of Bashan. There was also one governor over the land of Judah. Solomon's Prosperity and Wisdom 
The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They were very contented, with plenty to eat and drink. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River in the north to the land of the Philistines and the border of Egypt in the south. The conquered peoples of those lands sent tribute money to Solomon and continued to serve him throughout his lifetime. The daily food requirements for Solomon's palace were 150 bushels of choice flour and 300 bushels of meal. Also, 10 oxen from the fattening pens, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep or goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roe deer, and choice poultry. Solomon's dominion extended over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River from Tifsa to Gaza, and there was peace on all his borders. During the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety. And from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, each family had its own home and garden. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his chariot horses, and he had 12,000 horses. The district governors faithfully provided food for King Solomon and his court. Each made sure nothing was lacking during the month assigned to him. They also brought the necessary barley and straw for the royal horses in the stables. God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the east and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite and the sons of Mahal, Heman, Kalkal, and Darda. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals, birds, small creatures, and fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. Psalm 72 Give your love of justice to the king, O God, and righteousness to the king's son. Help him judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. May the mountains yield prosperity for all, and may the hills be fruitful. Help him to defend the poor, to rescue the children of the needy, and to crush their oppressors. May they fear you as long as the sun shines, as long as the moon remains in the sky, yes, forever. May the king's rule be refreshing, like spring rain on freshly cut grass, like the showers that water the earth. May all the godly flourish during his reign. May there be abundant prosperity until the moon is no more. May he reign from sea to sea, and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tarshish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. The eastern kings of Sheba and Seba will bring him gifts. All kings will bow before him and all nations will serve him. He will rescue the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed who have no one to defend them. He feels pity for the weak and the needy, and he will rescue them. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their lives are precious to him. Long live the king. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. May the people always pray for him and bless him all day long. May there be abundant grain throughout the land, flourishing even on the hilltops. May the fruit trees flourish like the trees of Lebanon. And may the people thrive like grass in a field. May the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all nations be blessed through him and bring him praise. Praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does such wonderful things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This ends the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Psalm 127 Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him.
Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. May 27. The Purpose of Proverbs These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. A Father's Exhortation Acquire Wisdom My child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. What you learn from them will crown you with grace and be a chain of honor around your neck. My child, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. They may say, come and join us. Let's hide and kill someone just for fun. Let's ambush the innocent. Let's swallow them alive like the grave. Let's swallow them whole like those who go down to the pit of death. Think of the great things we'll get. We'll fill our houses with all the stuff we take. Come, throw in your lot with us. We'll all share the loot. My child, don't go along with them. Stay far away from their paths. They rush to commit evil deeds. They hurry to commit murder. If a bird sees a trap being set, it knows to stay away. But these people set an ambush for themselves. They are trying to get themselves killed. Such is the fate of all who are greedy for money. It robs them of life. Wisdom shouts in the streets. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries out in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street, to those gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected the correction I offered. So I will laugh when you are in trouble. I will mock you when disaster overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster engulfs you like a cyclone, and anguish and distress overwhelm you. When they cry for help, I will not answer. Though they anxiously search for me, they will not find me. For they hated knowledge and chose not to fear the Lord. They rejected my advice and paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. But all who listen to me will live in peace, untroubled by fear of harm. The Benefits of Wisdom My child, listen to what I say, and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to Him. Then you will understand what is right, just, and and fair, and you will find the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. Wisdom will save you from evil people, from those whose words are twisted. These men turn from the right way to walk down dark paths. They take pleasure in doing wrong, and they enjoy the twisted ways of evil. Their actions are crooked, 
and their ways are wrong. Wisdom will save you from the immoral woman, from the seductive words of the promiscuous woman. She has abandoned her husband and ignores the covenant she made before God. Entering her house leads to death. It is the road to the grave. The man who visits her is doomed. He will never reach the paths of life. Follow the steps of good men instead and stay on the paths of the righteous. For only the godly will live in the land and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be removed from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted. Trusting in the Lord My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years, and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then He will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when He corrects you. For the Lord corrects those He loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom He delights. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand, and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths, All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. By wisdom the Lord founded the earth. By understanding he created the heavens. By his knowledge the deep fountains of the earth burst forth and the dew settles beneath the night sky. My child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them, for they will refresh your soul. They are like jewels on a necklace. They keep you safe on your way, and your feet will not stumble. You can go to bed without fear. You will lie down and sleep soundly. You need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked, for the Lord is your security. He will keep your foot from being caught in a trap. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. If you can help your neighbor now, don't say, Come back tomorrow, and then I'll help you. Don't plot harm against your neighbor, for those who live nearby trust you. Don't pick a fight without reason, when no one has done you harm. Don't envy violent people or copy their ways. Such wicked people are detestable to the Lord, but He offers His friendship to the godly. The Lord curses the house of the wicked, but He blesses the home of the upright. The Lord mocks the mockers, but is gracious to the humble. The wise inherit honor, but fools are put to shame. A Father's Wise Advice My children, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment, for I am giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions, for I too was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, Take my words to heart, follow my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom, develop good judgment, don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head. She will present you with a beautiful crown. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. 
Don't do as the wicked do, and don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep moving. For evil people can't sleep until they've done their evil deed for the day. They can't rest until they've caused someone to stumble. They eat the food of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they are stumbling over. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. May 28. Avoid Immoral Women My son... Pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. Then you will show discernment, and your lips will express what you've learned. For the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. For she cares nothing about the path to life. She staggers down a crooked trail and doesn't realize it. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I am about to say. Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. If you do, you will lose your honor and will lose to merciless people all you have achieved. Strangers will consume your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. You will say, how I hated discipline. If only I had not ignored all the warnings. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I have come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets? Having sex with just anyone, you should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman, or fondle the breasts of a promiscuous woman? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. They are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. Lessons for Daily Life My child, if you have put up security for a friend's debt or agreed to guarantee the debt of a stranger, if you have trapped yourself by your agreement and are caught by what you said, follow my advice and save yourself, for you have placed yourself at your friend's mercy. Now swallow your pride. Go and beg to have your name erased. Don't put it off. Do it now. Don't rest until you do. Save yourself, like a gazelle escaping from a hunter, like a bird fleeing from a net. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. What are worthless and wicked people like? They are constant liars, signaling their deceit with a wink of the eye, a nudge of the foot, or the wiggle of fingers. Their perverted hearts plot evil, and they constantly stir up trouble. But they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant beyond all hope of healing. There are six things the Lord hates, no seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, 
A heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. My son, obey your father's commands and don't neglect your mother's instruction. Keep their words always in your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they will advise you. For their command is a lamp and their instruction a light. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. It will keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a promiscuous woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you. For a prostitute will bring you to poverty, but sleeping with another man's wife will cost you your life. Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with a man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished. Excuses might be found for a thief who steals because he is starving. But if he is caught, he must pay back seven times what he stole, even if he is to sell everything in his house. But the man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys himself. He will be wounded and disgraced. His shame will never be erased. For the woman's jealous husband will be furious, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation, nor be satisfied with a payoff of any size. Another Warning About Immoral Women Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from an affair with an immoral woman, from listening to the flattery of a promiscuous woman. While I was at the window of my house looking through the curtain, I saw some naive young men and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman strolling down the path by her house. It was at twilight in the evening as deep darkness fell. The woman approached him, seductively dressed and sly of heart. She was the brash, rebellious type, never content to stay at home. She is often in the streets and markets soliciting at every corner. She threw her arms around him and kissed him, and with a brazen look she said, I've just made my peace offerings and fulfilled my vows. You're the one I was looking for. I came out to find you, and here you are. My bed is spread with beautiful blankets, with colored sheets of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's enjoy each other's caresses, for my husband is not home. He's away on a long trip. He has taken a wallet full of money with him and won't return until later this month. So she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. So listen to me, my sons, and pay attention to my words. Don't let your hearts stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path, for she has been the ruin of many. Many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. May 29. Wisdom Calls for a Hearing Listen as wisdom calls out, hear as understanding raises her voice. On the hilltop along the road, she takes her stand at the crossroads. By the gates at the entrance to the town on the road leading in, she cries aloud, I call to you, to all of you. I raise my voice to all people. You simple people use good judgment. You foolish people show some understanding. Listen to me, for I have important things to tell you. Everything I say is right, for I speak the truth and detest every kind of deception. My advice is wholesome. There is nothing devious or crooked in it. My words are plain to anyone with understanding, clear to those with knowledge. Choose my instruction rather than silver, and knowledge rather than pure gold. For wisdom is far more valuable than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with it.
I, wisdom, live together with good judgment. I know where to discover knowledge and discernment. All who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. Common sense and success belong to me. Insight and strength are mine. Because of me, kings reign and rulers make just decrees. Rulers lead with my help and nobles make righteous judgments. I love all who love me. Those who search will surely find me. I have riches and honor as well as enduring wealth and justice. My gifts are better than gold, even the purest gold. My wages better than sterling silver. I walk in righteousness, in paths of justice. Those who love me inherit wealth. I will fill their treasuries. The Lord formed me from the beginning, before He created anything else. I was appointed in ages past, at the very first before the earth began. I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters, before the mountains were formed, before the hills I was born, before he had made the earth and fields and the first handfuls of soil. I was there when he established the heavens, when he drew the horizon on the oceans. I was there when he set the clouds above, when he established springs deep in the earth. I was there when he set the limits of the seas, so they would not spread beyond their boundaries. And when he marked off the earth's foundations, I was the architect at his side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence. And how happy I was with the world he created, how I rejoiced with the human family. And so, my children, listen to me, for all who follow my ways are joyful. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Don't ignore it. Joyful are those who listen to me, watching for me daily at my gates, waiting for me outside my home. For whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. But those who miss me injure themselves. All who hate me love death. Wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. She has prepared a great banquet mixed the wines, and set the table. She has sent her servants to invite everyone to come. She calls out from the heights overlooking the city, Come in with me, she urges the simple. To those who lack good judgment, she says, Come, eat my food, and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. Anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise, and they will love you. Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. If you become wise you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. Folly calls for a hearing. The woman named Folly is brash. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. She sits in her doorway on the heights overlooking the city. She calls out to men going by who are minding their own business. Come in with me, she urges the simple. To those who lack good judgment, she says, Stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret tastes the best. But little do they know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of the grave. The Proverbs of Solomon The Proverbs of Solomon A wise child brings joy to a father. A foolish child brings grief to a mother. Tainted wealth has no lasting value, but right living can save your life. The Lord will not let the godly go hungry, but he refuses to satisfy the craving of the wicked. Lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. A wise youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. The godly are showered with blessings. The words of the wicked conceal violent intentions. We have happy memories of the godly, but the name of a wicked person rots away. The wise are glad to be instructed, but babbling fools fall flat on their faces. 
People with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall. People who wink at wrong cause trouble, but a bold reproof promotes peace. The words of the godly are a life-giving fountain. The words of the wicked conceal violent intentions. Hatred stirs up quarrels, but love makes up for all offenses. Wise words come from the lips of people with understanding, but those lacking sense will be beaten with a rod. Wise people treasure knowledge, but the babbling of a fool invites disaster. The wealth of the rich is their fortress. The poverty of the poor is their destruction. The earnings of the godly enhance their lives, but evil people squander their money on sin. People who accept discipline are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore correction will go astray. Hiding hatred makes you a liar. Slandering others makes you a fool. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The words of the godly are like sterling silver. The heart of a fool is worthless. The words of the godly encourage many, but fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Doing wrong is fun for a fool, but living wisely brings pleasure to the sensible. The fears of the wicked will be fulfilled. The hopes of the godly will be granted. When the storms of life come, the wicked are whirled away, but the godly have a lasting foundation. Lazy people irritate their employers, like vinegar to the teeth or smoke in the eyes. Fear of the Lord lengthens one's life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. The hopes of the godly result in happiness, but the expectations of the wicked come to nothing. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to those with integrity, but it destroys the wicked. The godly will never be disturbed, but the wicked will be removed from the land. The mouth of the godly person gives wise advice, but the tongue that deceives will be cut off. The lips of the godly speak helpful words, but the mouth of the wicked speaks perverse words. May 30 From Proverbs The Lord detests the use of dishonest scales, but He delights in accurate weights. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Honesty guides good people. Dishonesty destroys treacherous people. Riches won't help on the day of judgment, but right living can save you from death. The godly are directed by honesty. The wicked fall beneath their load of sin. The godliness of good people rescues them. The ambition of treacherous people traps them. When the wicked die, their hopes die with them, for they rely on their own feeble strength. The godly are rescued from trouble, and it falls on the wicked instead. With their words, the godless destroy their friends, but knowledge will rescue the righteous. The whole city celebrates when the godly succeed. They shout for joy when the wicked die. Upright citizens are good for a city and make it prosper, but the talk of the wicked tears it apart. It is foolish to belittle one's neighbor. A sensible person keeps quiet. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. There is danger in putting up security for a stranger's debt. It's safer not to guarantee another person's debt. A gracious woman gains respect, but ruthless men gain only wealth. Your kindness will reward you, but your cruelty will destroy you. Evil people get rich for the moment, but the reward of the godly will last. Godly people find life, evil people find death. The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but He delights in those with integrity. Evil people will surely be punished, but the children of the godly will go free. A beautiful woman who lacks discretion is like a gold ring in a pig's snout. The godly can look forward to a reward, while the wicked can expect only judgment. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper, 
Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. People curse those who hoard their grain, but they bless the one who sells in time of need. If you search for good, you will find favor, but if you search for evil, it will find you. Trust in your money, and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. Those who bring trouble on their families inherit the wind. The fool will be a servant to the wise. The seeds of good deeds become a tree of life. A wise person wins friends. If the righteous are rewarded here on earth, what will happen to wicked sinners? To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. The Lord approves of those who are good, but he condemns those who plan wickedness. Wickedness never brings stability, but the godly have deep roots. A worthy wife is a crown for her husband, but a disgraceful woman is like cancer in his bones. The plans of the godly are just. The advice of the wicked is treacherous. The words of the wicked are like a murderous ambush, but the words of the godly save lives. The wicked die and disappear, but the family of the godly stands firm. A sensible person wins admiration, but a warped mind is despised. Better to be an ordinary person with a servant than to be self-important but have no food. The godly care for their animals, but the wicked are always cruel. A hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. Thieves are jealous of each other's loot, but the godly are well-rooted and bear their own fruit. The wicked are trapped by their own words, but the godly escape such trouble. Wise words bring many benefits, and hard work brings rewards. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. An honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells lies. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. Deceit fills hearts that are plotting evil. Joy fills hearts that are planning peace. No harm comes to the godly, but the wicked have their fill of trouble. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. The wise don't make a show of their knowledge, but fools broadcast their foolishness. Work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. The godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. The way of the godly leads to life. That path does not lead to death. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. Wise words will win you a good meal, but treacherous people have an appetite for violence. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Lazy people want much, but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. The godly hate lies. The wicked cause shame and disgrace. Godliness guards the path of the blameless, but the evil are misled by sin. Some who are poor pretend to be rich. Others who are rich pretend to be poor. The rich can pay a ransom for their lives, but the poor won't even get threatened. The life of the godly is full of light and joy, but the light of the wicked will be snuffed out. Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. People who despise advice are asking for trouble. Those who respect a command will succeed. The instruction of the wise is like a life-giving fountain. Those who accept it avoid the snares of death. A person with good sense is respected. A treacherous person is headed for destruction. 
Wise people think before they act. Fools don't, and even brag about their foolishness. An unreliable messenger stumbles into trouble, but a reliable messenger brings healing. If you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. It is pleasant to see dreams come true, but fools refuse to turn from evil to attain them. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Trouble chases sinners, while blessings reward the righteous. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. A poor person's farm may produce much food, but injustice sweeps it all away. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. The godly eat to their heart's content, but the belly of the wicked goes hungry.